Thank you, Susan. And thanks everyone for joining us. We are very lucky to be together. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Peter Fowle, who earned a Master's of Science degree in Zoology from the University of Maryland and a PhD in Biology from Purdue. He is currently the chairman, chairperson of the Biology Department at Hartwick College, where he teaches ecology, evolution, and ornithology classes and conducts forest monitoring projects at Robert V. Rydell State Park. He will take us to Costa Rica to share his photographs, knowledge, and experiences there. Welcome, Pete. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay, let, let me see if I can get things set up here. So here and here. Okay, is everyone looking at a, okay, Charlie's giving me the thumbs up, so I think we're, we're good to go. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Um, tonight's talk is uh, really gonna be informal uh, and you're welcome to ask questions as, as we go. And um, if things are going well and I don't fall too far behind, uh, there'll be some pauses along the way that, and I can try to answer some of those questions otherwise, um, I certainly will try to answer them at the end, or even, you know, I can email you with, with questions that I'm not able to answer right now. Uh, so my goal is not to tell you a lot about any particular part of the biodiversity uh, in Costa Rica, uh, but it's to show you a bunch of photographs uh, of that biodiversity, photographs that certainly you could have taken uh, if you were in Costa Rica as well. Uh, there are about a half million species in Costa Rica uh, that may be about 5% of the world's total. Uh, and so uh, if my plan is going to work, uh, I'm going to try and show you about 0.02% of Costa Rica's biodiversity tonight. Uh, and if we're going to do that, I need to move us along. So Costa Rica is a very small country. It's about the size of, uh, of West Virginia, actually a little smaller than West Virginia. Uh, it's located between uh, Nicaragua to the north and Panama to the south in Central America. And, uh-oh, let's see. There we go. And uh, traveling is, is pretty easy to get there. Uh, typically, uh, I've traveled from New York City where you get a little bit better airfare. Uh, so from New York City uh, to Costa Rica down here in the southern part of Central uh, America takes about five hours. Uh, so Costa Rica is part of um, the Mesoamerican Biodiversity Hotspot, which is one of 36 geographic areas in the world that are identified for their very high biodiversity and the very high risk of uh, the extinction of that biodiversity. Uh, Costa Rica right now is often um, written about uh, for its amazing conservation efforts, uh, but that hasn't always been true. Uh, Costa Rica lost half of its forest cover between 1950 and 1990. Uh, primarily, it was cutting uh, forests down uh, to make pastures for cattle uh, to sell meat uh, to the United States. Uh, in the last few decades, they've really turned that around. Uh, there's currently a nationwide reforestation project, uh, and it's really being done strategically, uh, trying to encourage farmers, giving them incentives uh, to plant trees to connect patches of habitat that are important for the country's wildlife. So let's just kind of quickly take a look at a map of Costa Rica uh, to get an idea of the topography because the topography really uh, sets up uh, this vast array of biodiversity in the country. Uh, so if I can, let's see, oh, maybe I will not be able to get my little highlighter going. Okay, so um, if uh, you kind of look up on this part here, I'm assuming you can see my arrow. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean is here, the Pacific Ocean down on this, this part. Uh, from various places along this central backbone of mountains, you can actually see both oceans, uh, which is pretty extraordinary to think about. Um, the central backbone of, of mountains here uh, is 
continuously being changed. Uh, and it is really a series of volcanic mountains uh, being caused by the Cocos uh, uh, tectonic plate here, uh, sliding under the North American uh, plate that's up here, causing that up uplift and volcanic activity. Uh, so one thing that's really cool about Costa Rica is within a very short drive of either one of the major airports, you can be on the top of a volcano within a couple of an hour, a uh, couple of hours. So the mountain ranges uh, start uh, up here in the very northwest part of the country, uh, and this is the Guanacaste uh, mountain range, and then we have the Tilaran uh, mountains, the Central Mountains here, and the Talamanca mountains uh, to the south. Uh, in this area here, uh, this little uh, plateau is the location of the largest uh, city in Costa Rica. Uh, that is San Jose. Uh, there are about 300,000 residents in San Jose. It's a modern city, about 2 million total people in the greater San Jose area. Uh, this is the place that I least like uh, uh, in Costa Rica, uh, but it is a place where uh, we typically fly in. Uh, so almost half of the people in Costa, Costa Rica live in this relatively small part of the country. Uh, that's also a really good thing for biodiversity. So the mountains end up uh, setting up a very interesting thing uh, with the country. Uh, so these uh, cordilleras, the mountains, uh, in the middle here are blocking the prevailing winds that are coming from the Atlantic, uh, moving across the country uh, to the west. And as you know, there, as the uh, air moves across the Atlantic, it picks up moisture. Uh, and uh, in the tropics, of course, there's a lot of moisture that's being grabbed because it's so nice and warm. That moisture then begins to move upward on the mountains. Uh, that uh, warm, moist air begins to cool. When, when that air cools, uh, it begins to fall down as, as rain, as you can see in this uh, little diagram. So on this side of the country, uh, on the uh, windward side of the mountains, uh, you get a lot of rainfall. Uh, nearly uh, all year long. But on the western side here, the, the leeward side, uh, you can get some very dry periods. Now, uh, from May to September, uh, there's the greatest amount of solar radiation uh, hitting north of the equator where uh, Costa Rica lies. So that means there's a, an abundance of rainfall. Uh, and so it's that time of year where they have what is called the rainy season. Um, so their seasons are based on precipitation rather than temperature. Their temperature doesn't vary that much throughout the year, uh, but rainfall does. So the uh, wet season occurs during what, uh, the time of year that, that uh, we're having summer. Uh, and then from December to March is their dry season. Uh, their winter is dry, temperatures again about the same. Um, but again, the dryness depends on where you are with much drier conditions in this part of the country uh, than on the side of the mountains where the prevailing winds are, are coming from. So for tonight, um, uh, I was gonna show you this amazing map of all the different habitats in Costa Rica, but um, it's just too busy uh, and I think too much for us to worry about tonight. Uh, but because of these mountains, the elevation they create, the differences in rainfall that they create, uh, Costa Rica, while being no larger than uh, West Virginia, it's smaller than West Virginia, has an immense array of habitats, which then can host a lot of species. Uh, so for tonight, we'll really just kind of think about four ecoregions in the country. Uh, so one is here, this Caribbean lowlands, uh, on the east side of the country. Um, this is a, an area where it's, it's pretty wet most of the, most of the year. Uh, this is the area that you would think of as a rainforest. Uh, it's, as we move into the mountainous region, uh, the highlands, uh, we get a variety of, of wet habitats, uh, but we can actually get quite cold as we go up. Uh, the highest peak uh, reaches uh, over 12,000 feet. Uh, and so I've been uh, in a place in Costa Rica uh, and 
I was freezing cold one night in the field station. All we had was one wool, bl one wool blanket uh, and it simply wasn't enough. It was um, you know, probably about 30 degrees that night. It was absolutely freezing. Uh, and we had come from uh, San Jose, which was probably 85 at the time. So it was a you know, extraordinary change. And you can get this within a couple hours drive. That's really uh, one of the beautiful things about Costa Rica is the, how fast you can get to new habitats. So we have these highlands that uh, are typically quite wet um, because of the rainfall. Up here is this very dry, arid um, climate. Uh, and these are really interesting places to go to. Still lots of biodiversity. Uh, and the nice thing is if you're there during the dry season, it's much easier to see the biodiversity uh, in the Northwest lowlands than it is in the Caribbean lowlands, just because there's no vegetation to block your view. And then down uh, in the central and then down into the Southern part of, of the country, uh, we have the lowlands, the Pacific lowlands. Uh, and uh, particularly when you get down here to the Osa Peninsula, you're getting to kind of uh, wild Costa Rica. Uh, this is really where the greatest amount of, of Costa, Rica, Costa Rica's biodiversity exists. So just to give you a, a, an idea of some of these habitats, uh, this is a, a picture I took at uh, world famous uh, La Selva Biological Field Station. Uh, this is a very typical Caribbean lowland forest. It's always wet, it's always warm. Uh, you work all day, uh, you take a shower, you feel relieved for all of about three seconds, and then the humidity just makes you feel wet all over again. Um, so this is a, a wonderfully diverse place, uh, but sometimes difficult to see wildlife because it can be quite lush. Um, this is also a place where if you were to go to the Caribbean lowland forest, which is a place I would certainly would recommend, uh, you want to be there at night because at night there are so many things that you can see and it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. If we moved to that northwest uh, lowland area uh, in Guanacaste province, uh, we hit uh, a habitat type that isn't as well known as the rainforest, like the Caribbean uh, lowlands has. This is a tropical dry forest, one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. Uh, and it is truly a remarkable place to go to. So you're looking at Palo Verde National Park in Guanacaste, uh, these uh, ragged uh, limestone cliffs overlooking uh, a big uh, marsh in this case. Uh, but you can see that Trees are deciduous here. So during the dry season, they drop their leaves uh, and you get a really crazy collection of plants. Uh, you might be able to pick out here. There are cacti growing here as well. Um, so it's a very different type of habitat, not one that you would expect uh, because it's nothing like a rainforest. Uh, during the wet season, they do get a little bit more rain uh, and it gets pretty muddy and wet. Uh, but during the dry season, uh, they get very, very little rain. It can go weeks and weeks without any rainfall. So there's a, a, a real concentration of wildlife wherever there's water available. Uh, and Palo Verde has some of those uh, locations. Uh, this is a, a picture from the highlands. Uh, this is actually a, an old crater uh, that's been filled with water on Volcan Poas. Uh, Poas is just about an hour's drive from San Jose uh, in the um, central mountains, the Cordillera Central. Uh, and uh, Poas was the first national park established in Costa Rica. It's about 9,000 feet in elevation. Uh, and if you ever want to read about um, how national parks uh, were est established in, in Costa Rica. It's a very interesting story. It involves some three, uh, three graduate students from the United States. Uh, there's a book written about it um, with the title, The Quetzal and the Macaw, The Story of Costa Rica's National Parks by David Raines Wallace. Okay, with that really brief overview of climate and habitats, uh, what I'm hoping to do is to run very quickly through a whole lot of slides uh, to, to show you some of the biodiversity that you could see uh, if you went to Costa Rica. It just takes a little bit of planning uh, and it often helps to get some uh, of the local naturalists uh, to help you identify them. So I can take a quick pause if we have questions.
Yes, Peter, one of our attendees asked, are the volcanoes that you referred to active? Um, um, so this particular, they are. yeah, this particular volcano is not, but there are some that are active periodically. Uh, most recently, uh, Volcan Arenal was active spewing lava uh, and, um, you know, it at times causes some, some difficulties. Of course, you can't really predict when that's going to be happening and uh, they often have to clear people out of the area. But yes, some of the volcanoes do rumble, uh, throw up uh, gas, smoke, um, ashes, and occasionally lob, uh, lava as well. POAS has not done anything in, in quite a while. Could you describe where those volcanoes are? Um, so the uh, most active ones are going to be uh, in the Talamancas. Um, but you could go uh, up to the Tilaran mountain range, and there are some volcanoes where you'll see uh, kind of bubbling sulfur pits and other things. So there's a lot of volcanoes where you can get glimpses of various uh, kind of geological processes that are still going on. Thank you. But, yeah, there's a lot of good information on, on the internet as well, that, and you can find out maybe which of those volcanoes might be most interesting to you. Okay. Okay, so let's begin with frogs uh, and toads. So there are nearly 150 species uh, of frogs and toads in Costa Rica, uh, but you're not going to see a lot of them if you don't go out at night. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage anyone that ever goes to Costa Rica to find um, a place where they have some night tours because it is truly remarkable. Uh, you're, you'll see all kinds of amazing uh, frog species in particular, but you'll also see insects, uh, sleeping birds, uh, probably three years in a row, I, I saw sleeping wood thrushes uh, at La Selva, uh, which was fun to see. Perhaps they came from uh, New York, who knows? Um, but things like this uh, uh, new Granada cross-banded tree frog, uh, or we typically call it just the masked tree frog, which is widely dispersed throughout the country, except for that very arid Northwest region. Uh, it lays its eggs in swamps and puddles, um, which sometimes can dry out if it doesn't rain uh, for a couple of days. And so the uh, tadpoles have an ability to to remain alive for about 24 hours, uh, even though they might be completely desiccated. Hopping along the forest floor uh, could be the smoky jungle frog, uh, which is a huge nocturnal frog. It can get to be about eight inches long. That's about the size of your hand. Uh, these frogs will eat about anything that gets in their way. Uh, so they've been known to eat bird chicks, snakes, other frogs, insects, uh, even scorpions. This is uh, Rosenberg's tree frog. Uh, you can see the little uh, pads typical of a tree frog up, up on the uh, front toes in particular. Uh, this is one of several species of gladiator frog uh, named because of the aggressive interactions that sometimes occur between males. Uh, so female gladiator frogs only mate with males that provide a nest in a, in a pool or puddle. Uh, and males have really two choices. They can either build their own nest or they can fight another male and try and take over that nest. And so these fights uh, give this group their name, the gladiator frogs. This um, it is not the best photo in the world, but it is truly a remarkable looking frog. This is Lancaster's tree frog, this amazing metallic green uh, set on a, a brown black uh, kind of color is just, uh, just breathtaking really. So this is a stream uh, breeding frog in the lowland uh, rainforests of, of Costa Rica. Uh, this crazy looking frog with an enormous head, uh, proportionately large head, is uh, named the big headed rain frog. Uh, and it is distinguished by this kind of hourglass shaped set of um, uh, ridges on the back. Uh, they are variable in color. This is a really, really pink uh, frog. Uh, I'm not sure why it was so pink, um, but I didn't do anything with the color to this frog. This is the handsome evergreen robber frog, uh, a very small frog. Uh, 
uh, found in the leaf litter of rainforests. Uh, the females lay their eggs in just moist leaves uh, and the eggs hatch and develop into small little froglets. So there's no tadpole stage. This is something that's called direct development. So the one thing about Costa Rican frogs that's really interesting is they just do so many crazy things uh, in terms of reproduction. Uh, this is a frog that my daughter actually found uh, when she came down one time uh, to join us for a trip. This is the granular glass frog. Uh, and glass frogs, there are several species in Costa Rica. They're called glass frogs because the underside of the frog is, has skin that's nearly transparent. So you can see the heart beating, you can see the liver, you can see the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, it's re really pretty amazing when you flip these guys over. Um, so this is a, a frog that's found in any kind of humid, lowland, or even montane forest. Uh, and it also has a very unique way of reproducing. Uh, so this frog lays its eggs on leaves. Uh, so it makes an egg mass with lots of mucus, mucus that's sticky, it sticks onto a leaf. Uh, and those eggs develop into tadpoles that then drop down uh, from the leaf and fall into some body of water underneath. So there's a, a photograph of one of these egg masses sitting on a leaf. And you can see that this was very strategically placed uh, here by the female because when they start emerging from these eggs, they're just gonna slide right down this drip tip of the leaf and crash into the pond or the pool beneath where they'll then develop like a more typical tadpole. Uh, this is uh, presumably a way to get those eggs uh, in a place where they're safer than depositing them directly in the, in the pool of water itself. This is the hourglass tree frog. Uh, again, a kind of an hourglass shape here on the back uh, gives it its name. Um, they also have a very interesting egg laying strategy. Uh, they uh, use wet pools uh, on the ground of the rainforest in, in the leaf litter. Uh, and they may do one of two things with their eggs. So if there's a high risk that the, the eggs may uh, begin to desiccate, then they put the eggs directly in the water. Um, but if predation rates are high in the water, so if it's a, a more uh, permanent pool that might have fish in it, uh, then they will lay their eggs up on those leaves um, and the tadpoles emerge, fall down into the pool, uh, and as tadpoles, they have a better chance of escaping predation than they would as eggs. So they might lay in, in one of two different places. This is a, a tiny little guy, not much bigger than your thumb, uh, that I found in the tank of a bromeliad. Uh, so bromeliads you, you know, might have seen in a, a shopping mall or something. Their leaves come out uh, from a central uh, area and it forms a little tank where water collects in the middle. Uh, so there's a lot of things that live in there and this misfit leaf frog uh, was one of them hanging out in, in one of these tanks. Uh, the really neat thing about this frog is that uh, it changes uh, from a nighttime color of tan or brown uh, when it's uh, active um, to this bright green where it actually blends in really well uh, with the leaves. Now it doesn't look like that right now uh, because I woke it up and it's got its bright red eyes open, um, but normally it would have those eyes closed. And with those eyes closed and body flat, uh, it's remarkably well hidden uh, in this bromeliad. Uh, they lay their eggs on vines up above uh, ponds. And so again, tadpoles are dropping down uh, into the pool. It is the uh, uh, a related species to the most famous uh, tree uh, frog in Costa Rica. Uh, this is really kind of the, the poster species for rainforest conservation. Uh, this is the red-eyed leaf frog. Uh, they are nocturnal species. They stay well hidden in vegetation during the day, keeping those eyes closed. But at night, uh, they're out and about. This is a male uh, that was roaming about uh, at La Selva Biological Field Station. And we were lucky enough to, to catch it in action. Um, but I've seen um, many of these. Uh, and 
uh, have never grown tired of looking at this frog. It's truly a spectacular frog. Here's another one from a different location. Again, just stunning, stunning uh, creatures. One of the really fun groups of frogs in, in the tropics and in Costa Rica as well are poison dart frogs. And they're named because of the fact that they have very toxic skin and some indigenous people would use that toxin on the tips of arrows to help them uh, kill prey. Uh, the toxin uh, on this frog is, is very, is very uh, lethal. Uh, so just a small amount, if you were to you know, lick too many of these frogs, uh, you would end up um, probably having a heart attack and dying. Um, so the, uh, the green and black poison dart frog shown here, again, no bigger than your, your thumb, uh, many of them about the size of your thumbnail. Uh, they're really tiny, you can handle them just fine because as long as you're gentle, they don't start secreting a lot of the toxin. So it's, it's not uh, a real problem. Um, so this is one of several uh, dart frogs uh, that occur in Costa Rica. The most common is this one uh, called the strawberry poison dart frog, uh, or sometimes the locals like to tell um, tourists, the gringos, uh, that it's called the blue jeans frog. Uh, and you can see why. Uh, these are very active really all day long. They're out uh, during the day, males are calling. Uh, and they have an, another really extraordinary uh, uh, reproductive system. Uh, so after mating, uh, females lay maybe three to five eggs on the leaf of a bromeliad, uh, and the male will take uh, multiple trips to that area and transport water to make sure that it doesn't dry out. Um, he transports water in his cloaca, so essentially he's um, hydrating eggs by peeing on them. Um, after about 10 days, the eggs hatch and the female comes back uh, to where she laid her eggs uh, and the tadpoles swim onto her back. Uh, and then she transports those uh, to other locations uh, where they can develop. Uh, and she transports them to individual pools, uh, maybe in branches or again in bromeliads. Uh, separating them out so each one has its own pool. And then she visits those pools um, um, maybe on a daily basis. It's, it's not clear how often, but she does visit those pools and she lays unfertilized eggs uh, that the tadpoles feed on. So these tadpoles are very hard to rear uh, in captivity because they really depend on these unfertilized eggs uh, to develop. Uh, we we're particularly struck by the amazing variation uh, of coloration in poison dart frogs. And some of you uh, may remember uh, Abby Nelson uh, for her senior project, she asked whether you could at least over a short period of time, could you actually survey these, um, these frogs uh, by simply getting to know individuals uh, based on what they look like. So she took uh, hundreds of photographs of these frogs, uh, to document their color patterns, and then was able to go back and, and, and find them again uh, and identify, uh, yes, this was the same frog from before. So I know that it just made it through a week in the life of a rainforest. So these are the, you're looking at the backs of these frogs, uh, which shows quite a bit of variation. This guy here with this big uh, kind of Gorbachev kind of blotch on the head. Uh, some with, you know, really dark uh, forelegs, others have, uh, primarily reddish forelegs and so on. Uh, but the underside is extraordinarily variable. Uh, and so once you flip them over, it's pretty easy to see uh, chubby blue belly, uh, you know, and others that are uh, more of a, an orangey color or red color here with, um, looks like some kind of statue here. This almost looks like North America and South America on the, on the belly of this frog extreme variation. So you could uh, get to know your local uh, strawberry poison dart frog simply by the coloration, at least for the short term. We don't know if they end up changing over their lifespans, uh, but we know for at least a few weeks they, they can be recognized by their color patterns. Okay, uh, so I wanna move on to reptiles. Are there any uh, quick questions for? Yes, 
one of the listeners is wondering, around here, most frogs are green or brown or something like that. Why is there such spectacular coloring of frogs down in Costa Rica? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And, and many times uh, the most likely answer is, uh, and it would be true for the frogs that we're looking at right now, that red, bright red color is is warning uh, potential predators that they are toxic and, and uh, the predator doesn't want to try to eat it. Uh, and then that would allow them to be active during uh, the daytime. Um, so most of it is warning coloration. The bright red eyes of the leaf frogs is presumably to scare predators. Uh, so if a predator is creeping up on it during the day, it opens those bright red eyes and uh, supposedly gives a startle to the predator, giving it just a second to get away. Another listener has asked, has anyone studied how these dart frogs have become so variable? Is it a diet thing or what? Um, as far as I know, we don't know why they're so variable. Um, and that would be an interesting thing to, to look at. It would be fun to, to rear them up and see if it, it's got a genetic basis. So uh, is blue belly here gonna have kids that also have this really blue bell, belly? I love blue belly, he's so cute. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's quickly talk about some reptiles. Uh, so reptiles are also quite diverse in Costa Rica and you will see plenty of them, about 300 species. Uh, and snakes make up about 60% of those species. So if you're a snake lover, you wanna be in Costa Rica for sure. Uh, there are about 14 species of turtles, 70 species of lizards, uh, more than 200 species of snakes, and, uh, and a couple species of crocodile. So this is one of the most common reptiles you'll see in Costa Rica. This is the green iguana. Uh, this is a leaf eating uh, species that you find up in trees. Uh, this is a, a photograph of a very curious young green iguana. Uh, they often bask along uh, up on limbs of trees high uh, in the canopy along the edge of rivers and streams. Uh, if a predator comes down, tries to get them, they simply fall down uh, into that stream and then swim off uh, to the bank well below the predator and into safety. So they hang on the edge of rivers, which means that you can get some really nice photographs. As they get older, uh, their, their uh, color really changes, particularly in the males, they become really orange. So here's a large green iguana um, showing off some of that uh, beautiful orange uh, coloration. Uh, and uh, maybe it's just me, but I think these guys are amazingly photogenic. Uh, this one sticking his tongue out at me. Um, here's another male hanging out uh, over a river and in the uh, Caribbean lowland forest. So males can get uh, as large as about six feet uh, in length and weigh uh, about 15 pounds. Um, so it's, it can be quite a large uh, lizard, not one that you wanna try to uh, pick up and hold. Elsewhere in, a, in slightly more arid locations is another large lizard. This is the Tinosaur or the black iguana. Uh, it's a little bit more terrestrial than the green iguana, which is rarely on the ground. Uh, the uh, black iguana is often wandering around on the ground, uh, even though they're really good climbers. Uh, and they're also particularly fast runners. So some of these are, have been clocked at about 25 miles per hour. This is a real common uh, lizard on the, um, the floor of forests throughout Costa Rica. Uh, this is the Central American whiptail. Uh, and this happens to be a juvenile. Uh, and I can tell that because of that metallic blue tail that ends up turning brown in adults. So the juveniles carry this bright blue tail around with them. Uh, and it's not clear uh, exactly what that's uh, um, used for. Uh, Another thing that you'll see in terms of reptiles are lots of anolis uh, lizards. The, the anoles, about 20 species in Costa Rica. Uh, and I have to admit that I uh, haven't uh, found a good enough guide uh, or I don't currently have access to a good enough guide to uh, identify this particular species. It's one of uh, the pig-nosed uh, uh, anolis of Costa Rica. Uh, this is a male that's uh, stretching out this throat patch, this dewlap, uh, and 
Uh, he's either doing that uh, to impress me, which I don't think is true, or there was probably a female that was some, somewhere nearby. Uh, I couldn't find it, so she was pretty well hidden, but he knew he's that uh, she was there and he's puffing out that dewlap to kind of show off for her. This is a, another lizard that you might have heard about. This is one of two species of basculus lizards. Uh, these are the so-called Jesus Christ lizards uh, that can scurry across the surface of, of streams and rivers uh, to get away from predators. Um, on my last trip to Costa Rica, I saw lots of juvenile basculus li lizards actually doing that. So they can run on the surface of water. It's pretty amazing how fast they can move. Uh, this particular lizard is the common basculus, a uh, very handsome lizard. Uh, and it's typically found uh, near rivers and streams uh, because it does use that, uh, that um, behavior of, of kind of crossing a river uh, on the surface to get away from predators. Uh, this is a, a second species. This is a male. Uh, we can tell by the, the, the crest on the head and also on the back. This is a male plumed basculus or green basculus uh, wandering around on the forest floor. In addition to all these lizards that, um, that you see running around at night, uh, you can see lots of different species, including geckos. Uh, this is one of the geckos. Uh, I was so excited to get a close up that I didn't stop to think that uh, the distinguishing characteristic of this is the tail, which is kind of swollen. Uh, this is the turnip tailed gecko. Uh, and yeah, uh, you would never know from this picture it's a turnip tail gecko. You'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, but these are really cute little guys. Uh, almost anywhere you go, you might be uh, in a hotel or a, a cabina or something and, and have a little gecko uh, pet without even asking. They come free with the room. Snakes. Snakes are everywhere. They're numerous and they are uh, uh, diverse and they are dangerous. So when we take students to Costa Rica, uh, one of the things we do at every station, field station we go to is we review the things that can kill them. Uh, and that list is often uh, headlined by snakes. Um, so there are 22 venomous snakes uh, in Costa Rica, and this will encourage first time visitors to stay on the trails. Um, you're not likely uh, to step on anything that you don't want to step on uh, when you're on the trail. You're, you'll see the snake um, well in advance. But if you get off, some of them are well hidden. Uh, so this is the deadly ferder lance, uh, which looks uh, something like our copperhead. Uh, it is the most dangerous uh, snake in Costa Rica, uh, mostly because of its abundance. Uh, it was responsible uh, I guess it is responsible for about 50% of the bites that occur, uh, and 30% of those require some hospitalization. Uh, before 1947, uh, there was actually a fatality rate of about 9%. Uh, so now uh, there's actually a, a, an antidote uh, to the venom. And so if you can get to a hospital or a medic, uh, you can get the antidote and it's likely you can, you'll certainly save your life, but you might you know, prevent your leg from going gangrene and having to be amputated. Um, this is a really common, yeah, I left out, I see Charlie's uh, a facial expression. I left off the picture of a, a boy with a gangrene leg uh, because of a fair to lance bite. It's really pretty uh, disgusting. Uh, these are really common. We see them almost every time uh, that we've gone to Costa Rica. This, I think, but please don't uh, hold me to it, is a Northern cat-eyed snake. Uh, it's a relatively small snake uh, dangling down from a vine uh, just over the trail as we're walking. Uh, this is at night, uh, and this is hunting for frogs and their eggs. Uh, and it's particularly fond of a, uh, a red-eyed tree frog that we just talked about uh, as its prey. Some snakes can be quite large. This is a boa constrictor. Uh, and I found this snake because it was in a shrubby area along the road. Uh, this was actually in the Northwest uh, lowlands in the arid uh, part of the country. And I found it because um, I, a bunch of wrens were going crazy. Uh, and as I looked over, I saw why they were so concerned. 
uh, because the snake was slowly moving on uh, and clearly interested in trying to catch one of them off guard. Um, so they are uh, very um, uh, big snakes uh, and can really feed on a lot of things, uh, but they will take uh, birds if they get the opportunity. So hopefully you can see the eye of the snake here. And if you look back here, you can see these, what look like eyelashes. Uh, and that's what gives the snake the name. It's the eyelash viper, a venomous snake. Uh, and it is a, a snake that is incredibly variable in coloration. It's small and it's arboreal, uh, and it comes in this beautiful lichen pattern, which uh, makes it really well camouflaged. It also comes in uh, uh, various bright colors as well. Uh, here's another lichen colored uh, eyelash viper. You can see the eyelashes a little bit better here. Uh, and here's the most common bright color, um, this beautiful uh, yellow colored eyelash viper, uh, another one here. Uh, so you would think that this particular snake wouldn't do well at sneaking up on uh, any prey species, um, but the naturalists say that one of their favorite places to go is here uh, in the heliconia flowers, uh, in among the yellow of the heliconia, and they wait for hummingbirds to come by uh, and they try to grab that hummingbird as it's trying to get a little nectar treat from the heliconia. Um, so they are venomous snakes. They just need to get a bite in and then they can track that uh, hummingbird as it, as it dies quickly thereafter. One of the most beautiful snakes that I've seen is this incredibly thin um, green parrot snake uh, or commonly called the laurel. Uh, and it is, uh, this particular snake was probably almost three feet long uh, and probably not much bigger than two pencils uh, wrapped together for the entire length of its body. The biggest uh, reptile in Costa Rica is, uh, is shown here, the American crocodile that occurs in rivers, uh, brackish water rivers, uh, and they can get up to about 12 feet in Costa Rica. They are becoming very numerous and they can be dangerous. Um, every once in a while, uh, someone loses their life uh, swimming in a river where they should not be swimming. Um, there's also a very famous place uh, not far from San Jose, uh, the, uh, and it's a bridge, it's called uh, the Crocodile Bridge. Uh, and you can walk onto that bridge, uh, be careful, you get hit by a truck passing by at about uh, 65 miles an hour. But the Tarcoles River is below and the Tarcoles crocodiles are numerous and large below the river. Uh, they seem to hang out there because a nearby restaurant owner often throws his extra chicken down there. Um, so they're uh, kind of supplemented and uh, hang out. It becomes quite a tourist attraction. Okay, um, moving on from reptiles. Let's talk about the most numerous uh, group of animals in Costa Rica. So of the half million species in Costa Rica, about 300,000 are insects. Uh, many of them are these amazingly photogenic butterflies. Uh, so I know next to nothing about these butterflies, but I think I've identified them correctly. So I can at least tell you their names. Uh, so this particular one is often called the blue banded purple wing. Uh, and it's a very common uh, little uh, butterfly that you might see anywhere um, in tropical rainforests. Uh, this is one of the famous Heliconius uh, butterflies, lots of species that all have very similar coloration. Uh, and the uh, coloration is a warning coloration to predators, the, the bright red and the bright yellow, uh, warning them that they may be toxic. Um, so there are about 40 species of butterflies that belong to this Heliconius genus. This is a really neat uh, butterfly. There are actually two species here, but we wanna look at this one here uh, and if you look at the wings, they're actually transparent. So wherever this butterfly goes, it's camouflaged because you can see through those wings. So this is one of, of a few species of what are called glass wings, uh, uh, glass wing butterflies. And so it's a really interesting way to, to maintain your camouflage no matter where you are. You simply 
let the predator look right through you. This is maybe the um, most impressive butterfly I've ever seen in Costa Rica. Um, this is a dead leaf. This is the butterfly, which is mimicking that dead leaf, uh, complete with veins. And you can even see coloration that looks like holes forming in that dead leaf. Uh, and they mimic not just in the way they look, but in their behavior. So whenever there's a breeze that comes through, they sway their body as if they were a dead leaf. And if you were to go and try and touch it, they simply release their legs from the leaf and drop down just like a dead leaf and remain still. Um, so they're incredible mimics. Um, I'm not quite sure how I saw this, but I'm awfully glad I, I did. Uh, this is another one of those beautiful Heliconia butterflies. I love the blue in the eyes of this uh, particular butterfly, kind of a circular blue pattern there. Um, this is called the inverse uh, long wing. Um, I think because of the pattern here that you're seeing. This uh, kind of bright green butterfly is very common in Costa Rica. Uh, it's called the malachite uh, butterfly. It's named after the mineral ma malachite, which is similar in color uh, to that beautiful green that we see in the wings of this uh, butterfly. This is the, uh, as best as I can tell, the tiger leaf wing. Uh, again, a, just a beautiful butterfly. Uh, the thing that really is striking is this bright yellow on the tips of the antennae. Uh, it's a very distracting thing when you see them fly, you kind of focus up here and, and uh, it looks like it's kind of floating uh, with nothing attached. Uh, so it's, it's likely to be a, a nice way to distract uh, potential predators. This cute little guy is a blue-winged uh, 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 Eurabia, if I'm uh, remembering, uh, sometimes called the metal mark butterfly, the metal mark uh, because of this blue metallic patch uh, on the hind wings. So this is a butterfly that's otherwise brown uh, and opens up those wings to show the flash of blue, uh, presumably to scare uh, would-be predators away. Uh, this has a tongue that's incredibly large uh, so it allows it to get into some of these really long floral tubes that occur in flowers in, in Costa Rica. This is another Heliconius butterfly. This is the zebra longwing, a very common one, often uh, roosts with other uh, butterflies uh, up in the canopy um, and then comes down and, fl and flies around feeding on pollen during the day. This is the red cracker. Uh, that uh, you might wonder why it's called the red cracker, but if it, uh, if it closed its wings, you would see the red in, in the wings and, and know why it gets its name. Uh, so this is named for a crackling sound uh, that's made uh, by the butterflies. Uh, people say it sounds almost like uh, bacon sizzling in the pan. This is a Sarah Longwing uh, butterfly. Again, just a, a beautiful butterfly uh, that you see down uh, near the forest floor uh, throughout Costa Rica. And then um, this is a banded orange heliconia or an orange tiger butterfly. Um, and it's a re relatively large butterfly. Again, the, um, really beautiful. It feeds primarily on nectar of flowers, but also doesn't mind uh, feeding on some bird droppings uh, to get some nitrogen and, and and other nutrients. The most famous butterfly in Costa Rica is this butterfly, the blue morpho butterfly, which when it is uh, uh, on vegetation uh, and has wings closed, um, you know, doesn't look particularly spectacular, all these beautiful spots on it, but otherwise uh, various colors of brown. Uh, but when it opens, you get this incredible blue um, metallic blue, bright blue display. Uh, again, the thought is this is an anti-predator display, um, but they are, you know, very large butterflies. So I think I would say most, some of those could get about um, seven, maybe six or seven inches across. Beautiful butterflies um, that you see down near the, uh, the forest floor 
uh, and occasionally you get that glimpse of beautiful blue. It's really hard to actually get a picture of it. There are lots of other insects. Um, I, I presented uh, maybe last year, uh, or maybe two years ago, uh, about odonates, and this is uh, the world's largest damselfly. This is the blue-winged helicopter damselfly. Uh, they can get up to about eight inches uh, in length. They're called helicopter damselflies because the four wings of the damselfly kind of move independently in this whirly uh, configuration that looks almost like a helicopter. Um, so they're really extraordinary to watch. That they look like they really don't fly well, but they they seem to to get by pretty um, from day to day uh, fine. I have no idea what species this is, but it is a katydid that's uh, a beautiful leaf mimic. Uh, again, I mean, it almost looks like these are raised veins of a leaf. Here's the midrib. I mean, it's just extraordinary, the detail uh, of the mimicry in, in some of these species. Speaking of uh, species that can be about the size of your hand, uh, this uh, beetle, the rhinoceros beetle, uh, one of the scarab beetles, a uh, very common group of beetles throughout the world, occurs in lowland rainforests, uh, might live up to two, uh, two, three, maybe four years, and can get almost the size of your hand. Uh, males fight uh, with this lower horn, so they hook each other and try to flip each other off uh, a territory that might have uh, a, a female waiting to uh, mate with it. Uh, this is a spotted weevil, uh, which is, uh, was about the size of my thumb. Um, it's just really such a cool creature. It's got this long snout-like mouth part, and then the antennae come off of that. Uh, it's hard to see, but these are really intricate feet uh, with pads and hooks and all kinds of things. Uh, so this crawls along on the forest floor. Um, and it feeds, I think, primarily on vegetation. So if any of you know Stan Sessions, that will help you um, with the scale for this picture. Um, but Stan Sessions, uh, I believe, is about 6'4", uh, and he has ginormous hands on which uh, this red-legged grasshopper is sitting. Um, so these are enormous grasshoppers, uh, this from the Northwest uh, lowlands. Uh, and sometimes they actually become big agricultural pests and have big swarms that fly through and, and feed on crops, uh, but just enormous in size. So keeping on the creepy crawly theme, uh, uh, if you're in Costa Rica, you will see scorpions. Uh, and uh, this is one here, very dark in coloration. Often they're much lighter brown. It looks like it was feeding on a cricket when I found it uh, on a night hike. Uh, and so um, oftentimes, if you're not careful, uh, you can be stung by a scorpion. Uh, so far, I have not been, so I don't have any direct experience. Uh, but there, there's an interesting quote from uh, a research biologist about his encounter with a scorpion. And he said, the sting is like this. Uh, there was immediate pain, as if being penetrated by a thorn much larger than the actual sting. The sight of the sting felt tight and as if it were burning, although there was little visible uh, inflammation at the site. After about an hour, the pain had subsided to the point where I was more aware of a sensation of tingling, like when you stick your tongue on a nine volt battery. I'm not sure who does that, but anyway, you get the idea. Uh, after an additional half hour, the pain and tingling had subsided to the point where my thumb felt like it had seal, uh, like a sealed paper cut on it. Uh, and then within a couple of more hours, I didn't even know that I had been stung. So it, it, it's not such a bad thing, uh, but it's something that I've uh, managed to avoid and hope to continue to avoid. This is uh, one of several species of tarantula. Uh, this was just a little baby. Um, um, probably if I had been brave enough, but wasn't, um, I, it would have filled up the palm of my hand, uh, and it was just a young one, so they can get quite large. Um, some of them are very uh, pretty colored. Um, this one is not, uh, but these are very common uh, all over. They can be in rainforest, they can be in the dry forest, 
Uh, tarantulas are very common. Most of them are, are harm, harmless, but you really don't want to be bitten um, by the wrong species. This is uh, something uh, that looks like it comes from a sci-fi movie. This is called a whip scorpion, uh, and they are arachnids. They have eight legs. Uh, you can um, count them. That should be four pairs, one, two, three. And here's the first leg, which is modified to act almost like an antenna. Uh, and so they have the ability to use those legs to get out in front and they can feel, um, so they're mechanical receptors and they have chemical receptors as well uh, to know when a, a predator is coming by. So they're ambush predators that come out at night. Uh, we see them all the time uh, in the, uh, the Northwest uh, arid lowlands. I had mentioned earlier uh, to um, Charlie and, and Becky and, and Susan that um, one of the most impressive things in, in Costa Rica are the ants. Uh, and each ant has an amazing story uh, and we simply just don't have time to talk about all these amazing ants. This is one of the uh, largest ants um, that I've ever seen in my life. Um, so this is called a bullet ant, uh, and it's so named uh, for the pain that it inflicts when it bites and stings. Um, this is also a species that I fear greatly uh, and have avoided uh, any kind of contact with this creature. Uh, so they're about uh, maybe, uh, big ones might be, um, you know, maybe about the size of your uh, upper part of your pinky or so, they can get quite large for an ant. Um, so amazingly, there's an entomologist uh, who is interested in understanding why insects sting and why the pain occurs and how that pain occurs. Uh, and so he voluntarily gets stung by insects and decided that it would be worthwhile if he could come up with a way of, of explaining how much pain is inflicted by different insects. Uh, so his scale goes from one to four, where one is, you know, kind of a sharp piercing electric shock that doesn't last very long. Uh, and four is an absolutely excruciating, debilitating, incapacitating, just shuts you down type of pain. Uh, it's like every nerve is firing in your whole body, he says, at the same time. So he's tested 80 uh, insect species for it. Uh, how much pain they inflict when they bite or sting. Uh, and three of them, he's given the rank of four. And you're looking at one that he said in an interview, he probably should make up a five four. Uh, so he said, the pain is, is remarkable. Uh, I quote, there's nothing even close to them. I've spent 35 years going around the world trying to find anybody who could compete with the bullet ant in pain and there's nobody even close to it. This thing will hurt you 12 to 36 hours. Uh, for some people, it goes on for two days. It just throbs and it goes through crescendos of severe debilitating pain. Um, so uh, my policy uh, is when you're walking through the forest, uh, the rainforest, your hands do not grab vegetation without first checking for these bullet ants. Leaf cutter ants are, are, are not quite so violent, um, uh, but uh, really just as fascinating as those bullet ants. So they are known for cutting pieces of uh, vegetation off of uh, trees and, and, and shrubs, often going high into the canopy to collect them. You're seeing here a worker bullet ant who is trying to drag along this piece of leaf that it's chewed uh, and brought down from the canopy. Uh, and on top of it is a smaller ant, same species, uh, in the same colony, uh, and it is uh, actually actively cleaning this, this uh, leaf off as it's being transported to the nest, uh, trying to get rid of any um, parasites, uh, parasitic flies or wasps that may then uh, ruin um, the farm that occurs underground in their nests because they don't feed on these directly, they actually use them to grow fungus and they feed on the fungus. They grow only a single species of fungus. That fungus only grows in the nests of leaf cutter ants, uh, and it gets passed on from um, one queen to the next as, as 
uh, young daughters leave a nest and become queens, they pass uh, the fungus on to their nest. Um, the interesting thing I think about these leaf cutters is they are basically farming a single crop, okay? Just like we do when we plant our, our commercial farms. And what happens when you plant a monoculture? You run into problems uh, with pests. Uh, and how do you solve it? If you're a human, you spray chemicals on it. How do the ants solve it? They do the same thing. They actually spread a bacteria that helps kill pathogens that might destroy their fungus. Uh, so they're using effectively chemical protection of their crop, uh, just like we do. Some of these nests might be um, about um, almost 100 feet in diameter underground when they get really, really large. They're really fun to watch. They make uh, what we call avenues on the forest floor uh, that are really visible. It's really crazy. Okay, I'm trying to see where we are. Okay, I have like tons more slides, so I'm gonna have to really pick up the pace here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a, the acacia ant, uh, and it's well known because it protects the tree this acacia tree from anything that comes near it uh, and it gets rewards from the tree. So it lives in these hollow thorns. Right here, this ant is drinking from a little fountain that produces nectar. Uh, and the plant also makes these little yellow, um, call, uh, little bodies of, of lipid and protein called Beltian bodies that it feeds on. Uh, and so it's a really amazing interaction between the ants and the plants. They, they also produce really pretty flowers and there's a uh, interesting story that go, goes with that, but we'll have to save that for another day. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward and I, I can answer questions at the end. I'm gonna quickly talk about a couple uh, mammals or actually just show you a couple mammals. There are about 240 species. Um, they're hard to get pictures of, so I don't have many. This is a small rabbit sized uh, rodent called an agouti. Uh, this is a very common species. This is the collared peccary, uh, forages on the ground for tubers, roots, uh, shoots, uh, and fruits uh, that might fall to the ground. In some places, it has a really negative effect on, on um, the reforestation in, in areas. Anteaters, always a treat to see. Uh, this is the lesser anteater, uh, up, is up in trees. It's a carnivore, feeds on insects, uh, insect larvae. Um, sloths are very common and you can see them in Costa Rica. There are two species. This happens to be the Hoffman's two-toed sloth, uh, the one that I've seen more often. They, op they also have a really interesting story to tell, uh, but they are leaf eaters. Uh, they will eat some fruit and flowers as well, but leaves are hard to digest. Uh, you know that if you know something about cows' digestive systems. Uh, and they also have symbiotic bacteria to help them break down the cellulose, just like uh, cows and other uh, ruminants do. Uh, and so they are uh, feeding very slowly uh, and, and spend a lot of time sleeping. And that's time that's needed for uh, digestion. Three monkey species in Costa Rica. Uh, this is the white capuchin monkey. Uh, I have lots of stories. Uh, I'll just say that they are very nasty little guys. They're omnivores, they feed on all kinds of things. Uh, spider monkeys are arboreal monkeys uh, swinging from trees uh, and they're often very high, very difficult to see. The one monkey that you're uh, certainly gonna hear in Costa Rica is the howler monkey. This happens to be a baby looking down um, and they are leaf eaters, which is uh, unusual among the primates. They really eat primarily leaves, almost never come down from the trees, um, but they have very loud vocalization so they can keep track of uh, neighbors and so on for long distances. The best mammals are the bats and there are more than hundred species of bats in Costa Rica. Uh, there are vampire bats. There are bats like this American leaf-nosed bat. There's actually three of them there looking at you. Uh, many of the bats consume fruit, which is different than our bats here, which are all, almost all insectivores. Um, this is one of several tent making bats. Uh, and this is the tent uh, that you might actually uh, look under to see these bats. So here you can see this big leaf frond here. 
uh, that normally would be open wide, but they chew along the midrib on either side, causing the leaf to collapse. And then you can see there's a little opening here where they go in and roost during the day. So this particular tent was exciting because this didn't have the species you just saw, but rather the most adorable bat in the world, I think. These are Honduran white bats. Uh, they look like cotton balls with little yellow uh, uh, ears and noses, and uh, they are uh, fig eaters, exclusively fig eaters, and they roost under these, these tents. So if you can learn to recognize the tents, you can take a quick peek under and, and see these adorable bats. So of course, many of you probably are interested in birds. Um, with our 900 species, we don't have time for 900 species, um, but I can show you a few at least. Uh, so many of them you probably know, the roseate spoonbill. Uh, this is called a crested guan, a big turkey-like uh, bird. Uh, these are black-bellied whistling ducks, and you might recognize the black neck stilt next to it. This is the great curacao, a female, a large pheasant-like bird, uh, a little fancy hairdo is what we say. Uh, and hingas are, are common coastal areas on, in rivers. Uh, this is the bare-throated tiger heron, a very large heron, uh, very stocky in build, but um, uh, as tall as a great blue heron. Here's a familiar face. Uh, this is the green heron, um, maybe wintering in Costa Rica, maybe a resident, uh, but they are in marshes and along streams throughout the country. Another Perhaps familiar species, the yellow crowned night heron, uh, very common in certain areas of Costa Rica, particularly coastal areas. But you're not going to see this one in New York. Uh, this is a boat billed heron uh, with this incredibly large bill and this crazy uh, head plume that flops around on, on the bird. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to see um, this particular bird, the stork. This is a jabiru. Uh, it is about four feet tall. Here's uh, mom or dad with the three uh, nestlings. Uh, and just a little bit better look at the size of this bird and the bill, which is just enormous. He's walking around in a, a rice field uh, trying to pick up frogs and invertebrates. Uh, in some areas uh, along the coast and mangroves, uh, lots of uh, birds are nesting, wading birds. These are young wood storks, uh, very close to fledging from the nest. Uh, this is uh, a limpkin that you might see around here as well, same species. Uh, they are common in some areas. Uh, this is a crazy looking bird. Uh, it looks like a dinosaur to me, something about the way the eye and the head looks. Uh, this is called a double striped thick knee. Uh, they have kind of really swollen uh, joints here. And I think that's where the thick knee comes from. Parrots are abundant and noisy uh, and often hard to identify. Um, this one, of course, is not. This is a scarlet macaw. Uh, you see them in the wild, but you can also see them uh, that kind of semi-tame at some tourist locations as well. This is actually a wild uh, scarlet macaw from the Osa Peninsula. Uh, this is one of uh, 20 other species of parrots. Uh, this is the red lord uh, parrot. Uh, here it is the red marking that gives it its name. Um, goat suckers uh, are uh, abundant in, in Costa Rica. This is the common paraquet. It's a lot like our whippoorwill uh, or poor will. Hummingbirds are the bane of, of uh, bird watching. If you think you're gonna go down and, and learn your hummingbirds very quickly, uh, I got news for you. You've got 50 species uh, to work on in, in Costa Rica and they are not easy to tell apart. As far as I can tell, this is a lesser violet ear. Uh, this is uh, formerly in a species that was grouped together and has just been separated. Um, and it's uh, uh, just a really long bill uh, helps it get into some of these flowers. This is the purple-throated mountain gem. I think you can figure out where the name comes from. That's the male, and there's the female. Um, so they're really dimorphic. Uh, this is the coppery-headed emerald, a very cute little hummingbird. The hummingbirds range in size from you know, very, very small 
uh, to quite large. So this is kind of a medium-sized uh, hummingbird, the blue-chested hummingbird. Many of the names help you um, identify them, um, but there are many that are look-alikes. Look One of the biggest uh, species is this violet saber wing, uh, which has this incredible iridescence purple uh, that is just amazing to see. Uh, trogons are a group of birds, uh, primarily feeding on insects and fruit that we don't have, except for the very southern part of the US. This is a slaty tail tro trogon, very beautiful bird, long tails. Uh, and this is a black headed trogon. Again, just beautiful birds, uh, very photogenic. Of course, the most famous of the trogons is the respended Quetzal, uh, which is uh, why a lot of people go to Costa Rica. So this is the best I could get. Uh, um, it's quite a distance away, but you can see uh, if you go down, follow the, the bird, here's the tail starting and it goes all the way down to here. Uh, so they extraordinary uh, males have really long tails. They have this emerald green, uh, just beautiful uh, uh, birds to see. Only seen in, in some areas of Costa Rica and often up in the high mountains. Uh, Motmots are really uh, common birds. Uh, this is a blue cap motmot. And if you look at the tail here, these barbs um, at near the end uh, basically fall off. And so then you've got this uh, just exposed middle part of the, of the feather and then this little end. Uh, so it has kind of a racket shaped looking tail because of that uh, odd uh, physiology, physiology that occurs. This is the fiery build Arakari. Uh, it's like a little mini toucan, uh, very big bill, very colorful. Uh, like many birds in the tropics, they are fruit eaters. Um, they'll eat insects as well, but fruit are really a important food for most tropical species. Uh, this is the emerald toucanet, uh, again, a beautiful species. Um, but if we wanna go from the small toucans to the big one, Here's one of two species of toucan uh, in Costa Rica. This is the chestnut mandible toucan. There are lots of woodpeckers. Uh, 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 this happens to be one called the black-cheeked woodpecker. They're a lot like our woodpeckers, but they do consume lots of fruit. Uh, any trip to Costa Rica will be filled with loud vocalizations from the great Kiskadi, a very large flycatcher. If you're lucky, you may see one of these. This is uh, a white ruffed mannequin. There are several mannequin species. Uh, they form leks where males display. Uh, uh, this one displays on a mossy log and it does this weird kind of flight where it kind of uh, goes up like a little butterfly and flits around and comes down. And the female is watching this and somehow determining which male she might want to mate with. One of the amazing things that I found my first trip in, in Costa Rica was the tanager diversity is amazing. So this I think is now called the flame rumped tanager. Might be able to figure out why. The speckled tanager. Uh, this one I got a picture at a bird feeder. Uh, and in Costa Rica, when you wanna feed the birds, you don't put out seed, you put out old fruit. Um, so it's feeding on some papaya. This is the beautiful blue gray tanager. Um, just an incredible color, nothing like uh, any of the birds that are uh, around here. This is a honey creeper. This is the red legged. You can just make out the legs here. Uh, honey creeper feeding on some berries. Oops. And this is uh, one of a few species of sparrows. They don't have a, a tremendous diversity of sparrows, but this is the rufous collared sparrow, very handsome sparrow. This is a black-faced uh, grosbeak, um, and it too relies heavily on fruits. The green honey creeper, you can just get a glimpse of it. Again, this kind of odd greenish blue color uh, it's really something that you don't see around here, but um, you see in this species and a couple of others in Costa Rica. This is the national bird of Costa Rica. Not this one, this one. So I only gave you a small spattering of some of the amazing colorful birds of Costa Rica, but Costa Rica chose this one. Uh, and presumably it chose this one because it's widely distributed, well-known, 
And even though it's not beautiful outside, it's beautiful inside, and it expresses its beauty with a beautiful song. Uh, and that, I think, really sums up what Costa Rica is like. They're not really flashy as a, uh, a really as a, a country, uh, but it's a beautiful country. They're beautiful people, they're warm people, uh, and they're really fun to be around. Okay, so I think I'll uh, end right there. Um, kind of went a little long here, but I'll answer any questions for anyone that wants to stick around and and ask, uh, or I could probably um, get your questions and send off emails later if you, if you prefer to do that. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, folks, if you scroll your mouse down at the bottom of your screen, you can find the QA button, and that's a good way to submit questions. One here is, what was the the last bird, the national bird? What is the name of it? Oh, yeah. How about that? I didn't even tell you. Uh, so this is now called the clay-colored thrush. It used to be called the clay-colored robin, but... Uh, clay colored thrush. Even the name is just, you know, drab and boring, but uh, it does have a beautiful song. So I think um, I'm not seeing other questions coming in. Somebody did have their hand raised. So it, if that's a question or a comment, you can go ahead and use the Q&A button. Um, I did want to uh, thank Peter, certainly, um, for just this great trip in the middle of what's going to be a very cold and long winter uh, for this different environment um, for us to enjoy. I will have a recording available and we will post it on the DOAS website. It probably won't be until Monday, but you'll get a follow-up email that will let you know when that is, is completed. So please feel free to share uh, tonight's presentation with others and enjoy, definitely. Uh, if there's... If there's nothing else, I think we're gonna close it down for this evening. Um, again, if uh, if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and pop it in there. And I do have a couple that are coming in uh, at the last minute here. For the intern who took the photos of the frog's bellies, how did she do it so that they stayed still? <laughs> Actually, it's a pretty good question, but they, if you flip them over, uh, they often stay still for, uh, um, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so. So you've got to move fast. Um, and then uh, it was harder to get the pictures from of their backs because they're less likely to, to uh, stay put in that position. Uh, but basically, uh, it took two of them and they work really fast. Caught the frog, calmed it down quickly put it on a lens cap, which is what they carried around to make a uniform background and snap that picture. But I know it, some of them were more cooperative than others. Nice. And a couple of people who are typing in um, that they really appreciated the, the presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, did, did you hire guides to take you into the forest? <clears throat> Um, we primarily went to biological field stations and they have guides there, so we use them. Um, when the, my family came down, we went to some areas that I hadn't been in and we hired guides for that. Um, <clears throat> so guides are really a big part of the Costa Rican economy. Um, people go to school specifically to be, <coughs> sorry, specifically to be uh, nature guides. And they know a lot about the wildlife in their area. But the other big advantage is they talk to one another. And so they know where that eyelash viper is because their buddy told them, oh, you gotta go on this trail because there's an eyelash viper at, at this location. And so they're, they're communicating with each other because they wanna make sure you get a good experience. Uh, and so when you hire a guide, you are guaranteed to see more than you would on your own. Um, so yes, I even hired guides after you know four or five trips down there. Uh, and I'm sure I would have walked by things that he was able to point out. Very nice. Their prices are reasonable. Yeah, they often uh, transport you as well as part of the, the package. So 
you hire a guide, they, they might take you to a couple of places and they transport you, they feed, you know, take you to restaurants, they do everything, it's all arranged, it's great. Peter, I know you had also referenced the book on the creation of the national park system. Can you email that to me when I post sure. the video online? I'll post that resource. And if there's any other resources that, you know, that you would recommend for people, I'll include that as well. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. There are great field guides as well for the birds and, um, and most other uh, organisms as well. Nice. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and yes, say good night now. Um, so we appreciate you all attending with us this evening, and we hope you have a great Thanksgiving. You too. Okay. Bye. Good night. Thank good you, night. Pete. You're welcome. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> I assume that's who it was. <laughs> Otherwise, there might be problems. <laughs> Pete, thanks for getting us thinking about, you know, licking toads and uh, nine volt batteries. Yeah, I, I, you know, I had to read that. I thought that was the most unusual description. Who <laughs> licks a nine volt battery? Has anyone done that? I don't know. Yeah. Have you done it? We used to do it to see if the battery had a charge. Oh. Put your tongue across the two terminals and you can feel the charge. Oh, so my you know God. exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I... Mild shock. Huh. I guess I might have to try it just to, yeah. We always have students stung by scorpions, but um, I'm, I'm a little bit more careful than they are. Right. Yeah. It, <laughs> oh my God. I did have one other question. I'm not sure if Jerry Ann is still here. She is, um, came in just a minute ago. Um, you mentioned several dangerous species, uh, which would make some people shy to consider traveling there. Is it safe generally to go? Um, it, it is a very safe country to go to. Um, a few months ago, it made headlines uh, because of a murder of a, an American tourist, um, but that was an incredibly um, unusual event. Um, so it is a very safe place to go. Um, you do have to be very careful though. Um, you know, you have to watch your stuff. So theft is very common, particularly in San Jose. Um, so if you're riding a bus, you need to make sure that if you have luggage on that bus, uh, you keep your eye on it, that it doesn't get pulled off by someone and stolen. Uh, Pickpockets. Um, my wife uh, went to Costa Rica, was sitting on her camera bag and had another one under her arm. And uh, when their ride finally came, she went to pick up the bag under her arm and it was gone. Um, so they are very good at finding tourists and stealing things. Um, but otherwise, you know, that's about the extent of, of anything that you need to be concerned with. Otherwise it's safe. Um, I mean, the driving is crazy, but we, we have survived. Uh, it, I mean, it is beyond crazy, uh, but uh, it is a safe country and uh, it's got a great medical facility, which is free. Um, so it's a national medical system and when you're in the country, you're considered part of that system. So you are treated at no cost, um, compliments wow. of the Costa Rican government. Um, uh, you know, food is, is um, inspected and in things like in the States. So, you know, you're not likely to get food poisoning or anything like that. Um, so it is, you know, remarkably safe. It is um, also, I think, very welcoming of American tourists, which we can't say is true in many places. Um, I haven't been there since Trump has been elected. I don't know if they're less welcoming, um, but uh, they enjoy an American dollar. Uh, and so they are gonna make sure you have a good time in Costa Rica and come back. Huh. Um, they also, you know, lots of people speak English, so you don't need to know any Spanish uh, and you can get around fine. So yeah, it's a, it's a great country to, to visit, I think. Probably the safest, Easiest way to see lots of tropical biodiversity.